and Angus informed the rest of us that uh, Angus was going to be uh, dressed in a schoolboy uniform, short pants and, and the rest of it. And Malcolm was going to wear a, a sort of a white silk airman's jumpsuit with, with uh, blue sort of gumboot type things. Um, and he asked the, the rest of us uh, if we can think of something. So the drummer at the time, Noel Taylor, came up with an idea of wearing sort of a harlequin sort of clown outfit with a uh, top hat. The bass player, Niels, Neil Smith, uh, come up with a, a New York cop sort of outfit with a crash helmet, jodhpurs and dark glasses, that kind of stuff. And, um, and I came up with the idea of, uh, of the ultimate parody of a rock star, I guess. It was a cross between uh, Rod Stewart and his jackets and stuff like that and Slade. So when we actually uh, went out at Victoria Park there in Sydney, the big open air concert, uh, the fans that were out there knew what we were like, they'd seen us. But when we walked out, the reaction was, uh, was quite amazing to tell you the truth. Uh, Schoolboy uniform and the rest of us were just, uh, we played the same music obviously. Um, and it had, such, it had a great reaction and uh, the schoolboy uniform uh, seemed to do something to Angus Young because uh, he really ripped up the, the stage. He just went berserk. Uh, I'd never seen him like that before. After we'd been uh, uh, gigging for a few months with, with this look, uh, another band in Australia came out called Skyhooks. And uh, they had weird gear on too, clown outfits and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, although their music was, was not as hard hitting and, and heavy uh, as what we were doing. Um, and I guess that's why uh, Malcolm then uh, said, right, we're, going, we're all going back to jeans and t-shirts again, except for Angus. Angus will keep his schoolboy uniform and, and uh, that'll make the difference between us and any other band around the place. Malcolm's decision to make Angus the focal point of the band didn't end with his brother's stage attire. Malcolm was really, uh, I suppose, the brains, I guess, um, of ACDC and uh, Malcolm was also instrumental in uh, putting Angus forward as the star, as it were, because when we first started, we did a lot of 12 bar and Malcolm and Angus both played lead. Um, Malcolm was a great player. Um, so we, though we had two guitarists in the band. Um, but we were on tour and uh, Malcolm uh, one day said, look, I'm not playing lead anymore. Angus can do all the lead. Initially when ACDC formed, and we're talking about 31 years ago now, I feel they probably were seen as no more than just another bunch of kids trying to make it on the local scene. Nothing more than that. It's only when changes started to happen and they got the right lineup together that the sparks started to fly. I think in the early days, it was very much a local band, another stepping stone for Malcolm with Angus, driving Angus along. The most important thing as far as that is concerned is it got Malcolm and Angus together in a band and proved that these two had something special. And you talk to people around at the time and say, band weren't exactly great. Wrong singer, Dave Evans, who was the original vocalist, wasn't fantastic. But Malcolm and Angus had something, especially Angus, because Angus was already developing his stage act. He was developing the famous walk, and suddenly people were looking at him and not at Dave Evans. Evans was growing restless. It seemed to him that his role in the band was being undermined, and arguments inevitably occurred. We joined, uh, or we formed the band as, uh, as a band, and it was a democratic thing, like with the with the name of the band and all this kind of stuff. And uh, um, by this time, with people being sacked left, right and centre, and also uh, our first manager, he got sacked as well. Um, I, I was uh, uh, feeling, uh, I suppose, as a founding member, uh, I, didn't, I wasn't being consulted with, with uh, a lot of different uh, decisions, uh, which uh, was quite upsetting, to tell you the truth. Um, I guess I'll, I'll let my feelings known too, uh, to Angus and Malcolm who would uh, at this stage would be uh, having meetings with George Young uh, and just virtually telling me what decisions. It became apparent to Evans that on closer inspection there were more young brothers in the band than there appeared to be. I guess uh, George with his experience uh, really was the mentor for Malcolm and Angus and really I suppose the unofficial manager. I mean, I didn't really worry about that. I mean, the experience of George Young was fantastic to draw upon. Uh, but as I say, it became uh, like a click, of course, with the, the young brothers. And uh, I realised by this stage that, um, that 
they expected everybody to toe the line uh, uh, of all decisions and um, and, uh, and if you're a creative person uh, yourself or you're young and full of spunk and, and all that kind of stuff and uh, um, and fire in your own belly and that kind of stuff um, yeah it does piss you off uh, I don't care what decisions were made but it would have been uh, uh, respectful if, if I was at least sitting at the table, if you know what I mean, yeah. Unbeknown to Evans, however, a new character was about to emerge who would change ACDC's path significantly. Bon arrived and suddenly it all fell into place. The spark lit, the bulb went on and the fire started to rage. The Scott family moved from Scotland to Australia in 1952. After settling briefly in Adelaide, they soon relocated to Fremantle, a quiet port south of Perth in Western Australia. Here, young Bon Scott was enrolled in the North Fremantle Primary School, where he befriended Ian Kant, a local boy who has kept close relations with the Scott family to this day. Well, I first met Bon when we went to primary school together in North Fremantle. Living in North Fremantle back in those times was a great place to grow up and I'm glad that I was born. I was born in North Fremantle. I was born in a hospital at the top of Harvest Road. It was a great place to live in and it was a great place for Bond to grow up in. To grow up around Fremantle, I reckon we, uh, you were privileged, you know, to be a Fremantle light, and that's what people call themselves, who live in, uh, brought up around Fremantle and still do. It's an atmosphere and a, an environment that really encourages people to, to enjoy themselves. And uh, we certainly did back in the 60s and those days. Bond, to me, was a little bit of a larrikin, full of life. Bon had an aura, and that showed up from a very early age. He had, he, he had something that attracted people to him. That, he had a, a, an easy-going nature. After leaving North Fremantle Primary, both Bon and Ian became students at the local John Curtin High School. It was a good high school to go to. Yes, it was. It was a very good high school. Um, the teachers were good. Um, the environment w was good and all the students at that time it, it was a fun it was a fun period in in, in, in his life and, and, and my life uh, high school was a was a good time yes it was Bond developed an interest in drumming and played with his father chick in the Fremantle pipe band in his mid-teens Bond became more interested in rock and roll and began to hang out at the local dances here he met Richard Selby, who shared his passion for music and would later become the singer of the Perth band The Troubadours. I first met Bon, it was probably at St Pat's, St Patrick's Church. They used to have a Sunday dance, a rock and roll dance on a regular basis. And there'd be bands coming and I was a young high school student going to John Curtin High School in Fremantle same as Bon, and we used to go to St Pat's on a Sunday and on a Friday we'd go to the Fremantle Police Boys and they'd have wonderful rock and roll bands on and we'd be there watching the bands. There was always something happening in Fremantle with rock and roll and, uh, and I think that was, that was a good part of our growing up before we actually got into bands that was influencing us at the time, we'd go and watch the other bands. And that encouraged us to practice a little bit more, try a little bit harder and try and form our own bands. Bon soon joined his first group, The Spectors, a cover band in which he was the drummer and occasional singer. They began to play the same dances in which he'd previously been a member of the audience. In 1964, I joined the Troubadours and he, it must have been about the same time the Spectres were happening and I think we played a couple of gigs together at a place called the Big Beat Centre in Anzac House in Perth.
And that moved later on, out to Victoria Park in Albany Highway. And I, I remember the spectres, but I'm not sure of the venues. I think it was those, the Big Beat Centre, where we'd share the gigs. And as well, as lo along with other bands like Russ Kennedy and the Little Wheels and I think Johnny Young and the Strangers and the, the, good, the, the better Perth bands that love the rock and roll and are playing good rock and roll. It was in this lively music scene the Bomb first met Vincent Lovegrove, lead singer with rival band The Winstons. I first met Bon in 1964-65 and he was in a band called The Spectres. He mostly played drums. The lead singer then was a guy called John Collins. And Bon used to get up and sing maybe three or four songs a night. Uh, and uh, we often as not found we were playing at the same venues. And he and I struck up a friendship. The scene in Perth, Australia at that particular time was there was a lot of cabarets and they had what they call corkage fees where you brought your alcohol to a club which were open till 3am and you paid for your corkage and they would store your alcohol. That's how they got around the licensing laws. There was also a lot of mining going up in the north of um, Australia at that stage, places like Mount Tom Price. Uh, and uh, the miners used to work on and off, they'd, they'd, they'd work for six months and take three months off and they'd accumulate a lot of cash and they came down to Perth and would spend it in these clubs. The only problem was, and of course they had lots of entertainment there, the only problem was the bands that they wanted to have there were primarily what we called top 40 cabaret bands. In other words, what they did was they, their repertoire belonged to the top 40 charts and what you heard on radio. There was no originality then. So therefore there was a lot of um, places that opened up in the surf clubs along, along, the, along the west coast. Um, one we played at a lot was, was at a place called Swanbourne, and they were called Stomps. On leaving school, Bond became a postman, delivering mail by day.